Uh, well, first, uh, I want to say thanks to Leslie and everyone else with the with the uh, council and um, uh, for doing this uh, and, and allowing me to be part of it. And thanks to all of those that are viewing with us today. Uh, and I say that in, and then thank you to uh, uh, Jeannie and Brian for just a fantastic presentation as well as to what uh, what can be done. And I think we should all, I certainly admire them and congratulate them on taking those early steps when it was really a harder thing to do uh, in this new area. Um, second, I wanna give just a real thumbnail of myself and go to the next step, slide here. I'm an attorney and I'm, I'm certain that you couldn't, oh, I'm having some, I'm being, I'm gonna get rid of my mouth, sorry, there. Uh, I'm sure none of you could tell from the uh, from the opening slide that I was the attorney. Uh, I obviously looked it, but by way of brief background, first on QTAC Rock, uh, we're a national law firm, but we're originally founded in Omaha, and uh, we've grown largely in the Midwest, but now have offices from coast to coast. But I've always admired our, our Midwest uh, founding and upbringing because I think it gives us a special kind of insight into the things that go on in the center part of the country here. Uh, and, and certainly it does for me and for my practice. By way of very brief background of, about me, uh, since I looked like a lawyer on the picture, I grew up on a, on a diversified farm in Northeast Nebraska. Uh, pretty typical story for a lot of uh, people my age when we were home, uh, when I was home, I'm the oldest of eight kids. Uh, we had a small dairy. Uh, 50 to 60 cows. We had we had uh, a farrow to finish, small farrow to finish, and we were feeding some cattle. And as it happened, when I left to go to college down the University of Nebraska, the cows left too. Uh, Dad at least had a little bit of uh, grace for me, and he sent the cows away my seniors, uh, the senior year of my or summer of my senior year. So I at least had one summer at home when I wasn't the main milker. Uh, but that really formed my experience and leads a lot into what, just how excited I am about what I think carbon and this new really uh, horizon in agriculture can be. Those that know me know uh, I often say that agriculture needs to be seen as the solution and not the problem. And the biggest reason for that is uh, having spent uh, first part of my career, 10 years as a banker, uh, I've been, I've worked for USDA uh, one time in a senior management position. Uh, and while I was in Washington, D.C. with that, I went to law school at night. And then uh, two times uh, with state government, including most recently, I was a, a state energy director for four years. But the, and then the rest of that time as a lawyer, all of those positions tell, told me that solutions get paid and problems get regulated. And that's what I think the carbon industry really allows us to avoid. I'm gonna hit a couple of really top end topics here first to give plenty of time for our, uh, for you to ask us questions and, and for our great other panelists to answer those. Um, but having spent my career both in, in government and in law and thinking about the kind of key contract issues that I've seen in the carbon contracts that we're working on already, and those that are on the horizon with clients that I'm working on, particularly in the protein sector, some of this is similar to always what we have with a contract. What's that agreement term? And an important one for us uh, as we look at these kind of agreements, if you put in the kind of investment that Jeannie and, and uh, Brian did, it's going to be critical that there's some length to the term of that contract to be able to recover those investments and having an opportunity for automatic extensions in a relationship that maintains that. I think that's a concern that's often today in, in uh, that I hear a lot today when I talk to producers, particularly in the grain area, because they're worried about, am I tying in for too long? I think our protein, protein sector is going to require that we do some of that just to recover the costs that we might uh, call on. Another area that I think will be of specific importance is audits. Uh, Jeannie talked about the audit process that she had to go through. 
And that will be a very important thing, both the frequency and notice. And also, if that audit reveals something, was it truly an issue? Or was there, for some reason, some mismatch in a measurement or a misunderstanding? And is there an opportunity for the producer to provide some additional information for corrections? Related to that is, is what are the default provisions? Obviously, this is true in any kind of a contract, but uh, if the contract party were to find the producer in default, uh, certainly there needs to be a, a, a notice given and a right to cure. Uh, now, on the other side, too, and sometimes I think we forget this in ag, what happens if that other party defaults? And it would be in, are they doing what they've promised to do with credits or payments to us? And what are the damages that we could call from them and the opportunities for us to claim on them? Now, as we're thinking about those defaults, the producer is always going to have to be concerned about as well, are there any damage provisions? Because if that contract party is making significant investments, relying on what you as a contractor, as a producer are doing, a farmer or rancher are doing, uh, they may very well want to include damages that allows them to recover if the contract is terminated early because of some default by the farmer or rancher. Some other things that I think we need to especially work at in, in this particular area is industry or regulatory changes. Uh, the most active area right now is really the voluntary market. We've not had hardly anything in the way of, of a regulated market other than the low carbon fuel standard that, that was mentioned earlier. But there might be changes, certainly changes in, in what's expected, certification, all of those kinds of changes. And can those be mandatorily put to the producer? And who pays if there's additional expense that goes with that? Uh, other practices or important things in the contract that the counterparty is not normally going to think about is what if there's a need for a production or a practice change? Um, is that allowed? Can the producer say, I've determined I need to make this change? Uh, I'm going I'm, to, I'm familiar with more of a, of a row crop world, but for instance, if in Jeannie's world, stocking rates were to change, or in my world with cattle feeding, if for some reason we were going to have to change either because of a regulatory issue or perhaps even because of market conditions, reduce the feeding capacity of our feedlot. What's the impact there, particularly in a case like uh, where the manure is being laid, uh, relied upon? And then what happens if I do some enhancements? What happens if I start doing more is there an additional payment? Is there a way for me to, is there a process for me to, as a farmer or rancher, to propose that and be able to reach an agreement with the contract party to, um, to recover those costs through some additional payment? Finally, a very important thing, and, and this is an issue that I see broadly in my practice, working with both agriculture producers, farmers and ranchers, and with the companies that work with them, uh, candidly, we have a demographic issue in agriculture. We have a very old ownership. And how is that, how are we planning for that within this agreement? Are we allowing for some success and succession or change of management, uh, perhaps even a sale to a different entity? How would that be treated under the contract? Uh, can we accomplish that only by notice or would the consent of the party be required? Uh, finally, and then I'll turn it back pretty quickly here for questions even before you get in the contract. And I think this is an area that we as in agriculture need to think about. What's the goal or objective of that contract party? When Jeannie was first contacted, it was clear they were looking at a, at a corporate climate, both a change commitment, I believe, and, and the branding image that she talked about. But that now I think we are seeing, and I'm working on several exciting new uh, projects that would allow really adding some value to the product that we're producing because of the practices that we're adopting. Each one of those requires or needs to have a little bit different approach and we need to listen to our customers to hear how that is. The final point, and, and, and I um, invite Jeannie and, and Brian to, to, um, to respond to this is that, are we committing to a practice or a result? 
Uh, as we all know, farmers and ranchers bear the risk of weather. We've certainly seen that in the Western US and I would say in Western Nebraska, uh, the drought this year. And that's an uncontrollable risk that we try to address with, with insurance. Uh, if we are committing to an individual site measurement, are we wearing that risk? Now, I don't want that to be seen as me being negative on individual site measurements. What Jeannie was talking about is critical. It's critical to validate the effectiveness of the practices that we're doing. What I'm talking about is just how does that affect us in a payment and how do we do that in the contract? Uh -huh.